Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Kia this week released a teaser image of the 2021 Optima sedan that set our little corner of the internet on fire. It looks fantastic, at least what we can see of it. This is hardly surprising, though, as Kia and its corporate cousin from Korea, Hyundai, have been pumping out awesome designs for a few years now. On today's show, we're going to talk about the Optima teaser, as well as analyze Korea's unexpected rise to the top of mainstream automotive design. Joining me is managing editor Brandon Turkis. How are you doing, Brandon? I'm doing very well. And in the other chair is writer Christopher Smith. How are you, Chris? Happy Halloween! Well, yesterday, anyways, when you hear this. That's right. That's right. Happy Halloween. Nothing scary on today's podcast, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see by the time we get to the end. Um, so before we get to talking about Kia, something actually happened uh, the day before we're recording this. That's really big news, and I wanted to mention it and get your thoughts on it. And that's the announcement that um, Fiat Chrysler is merging with uh, PSA, uh, the parent company of brands like Peugeot and Citroen and, and many others. Um, so that was just announced yesterday, really even last night that the merger, um, was approved and it sounds like another one of those merger of equals deals. But as I think we all know, it's never really that. And when the dust settles, we'll, we'll perhaps see which, um, side turns out to be, uh, maybe the, the one calling the shots. Um, some interesting facts are emerging from this though, that I'll throw out there before I get your thoughts. Uh, the first is that it's going to create the fourth largest automaker in the world. And the number of brands, I actually have to count them. I have them listed. Uh, it's Fiat, Jeep, Dodge, Ram, and Chrysler, Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Peugeot, Citroen, DS, uh, Opel, and Vauxhall. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And we actually counted yesterday. That's that's technically one more brand uh, than the Volkswagen Group, which to date has been, um, the, I think, the largest in terms of just sheer number of brands. Um, of course, the valuable thing that FCA brings to the table is Ram and Jeep. That is, those are the two kind of coveted brands that FCA holds, and that anyone who has talked to them about merging or acquisition. Uh, has coveted. Um, meanwhile, FCA, which uh, is has a very, let's say, politely dated lineup of cars, um, gets access to PSA's kind of modern platforms uh, for passenger vehicles. Um, so that's kind of, and then of course, they're going to get the economies of scale that come with being a much larger company and lots of savings from that. Um, but I wanted to get your reaction. So, Brandon, let me start with you. Uh, you actually, I think, found the news yesterday as soon as it happened. Um, what was your first uh, reaction to hearing about the merger? I mean, as, as somebody that grew up in, in Detroit in the 1990s, anytime I hear the phrase merger of equals, I, I develop like a very sudden tick. And I have a little bit of PTSD from it from the Daimler Chrysler days. Uh, this This seems like a very good deal for FCA and a very good deal for PSA. Um, I'm excited about the prospect of French cars coming back to the U.S. I think uh, Peugeot and Citroen and DS have a really impressive line of crossovers. Uh, every time I'm over in Europe, I'm, I'm consistently amazed by the number of crossovers from each brand that I see. They're absolutely everywhere over there. I think it'll be great for Chrysler, though, because there's a more developed line of electrified vehicles from those brands. And there's a very good line of commercial vehicles as well. So, and the reality is that, you know, FCA's uh, Fiat based commercial vehicles, uh, the Ducato and the Duplo, which are the pro master series here in the U S are just really not that great. So I think the idea of, of French commercial vehicles coming over here, French crossovers coming over here, especially for the Chrysler brand, which is either going to go away or is going to become a really big deal if they start if they get access to PSA's line of crossovers. Uh, I think it's it's very exciting for them. It's interesting that you bring up the commercial vehicles and particularly the the ProMaster in the U.S. because I'm as you know I'm. Uh, pretty big into like the the camper van scene and in the camper van scene in the u.s which is you know van life is so popular there's there's three choices right the sprinter um the the ford transit and the uh, ram promaster 
And the, the Pro Master is really popular, and I've learned some advantage that it has over the, the Sprinter and the, and the Transit. Um, one being that the interior size is, is larger. There's actually more interior room because it, 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 uh, the walls aren't as thick and things like that. So um, I'll be interested to see if they, they replace uh, the Pro Master with a PSA product or if they just bring more PSA products over to bolster their commercial vehicle lineup. Uh, because the commercial vehicle segment has really grown way more competitive in the past 10 to 15 years. It used to be just dominated by Ford, really. And now it's every uh, automaker is seemingly coming in to take uh, their small pie, small uh, piece of the pie. Um, so that's a really good a good observation. I, did, I wasn't even thinking commercial vehicles before. And electric vehicles as well. That was another good point because Chrysler is... is uh, nowhere in, in terms of electrification. I will say I, I do hope the the French commercial vehicles come over here, especially Citroen, because they have the best names. Like they have two vehicle two vehicles off the top of my head: the Citroen Jumpy and the Citroen Bongo, yeah. which are just which are just fantastic <laughs> names no for way. like small they commercial are. vehicles. There's no way they're going to come over with those names, though. I wish oh, they I, were. I but we're, they're going to they're going to make something like Promaster Light, and you know. Uh, yeah, honestly, like it's I, I I hope they come over because you know I I appreciate that there's a, a subset of people that like that appreciate what the Promaster is, but it is far and away one of the worst driving vehicles I've ever experienced. Huh, I haven't I haven't driven one, so I'm kind oh, of God, uh, it's absolutely awful. That's interesting. Um, well, and and I think another really big, probably the biggest unanswered question are are these European brands going to appear on U.S. shores, or is it going to be more about platform sharing and they're going to be donating platforms um, and cars to the American brands to sell under their names? I don't think we know uh, the answer to that question uh, for sure. I don't think Uh, we'll know that answer for another six months, honestly. Yeah, probably. Chris, let me switch it to you. What do you think? You guys forgot the best Citroen name of all time, the Space Tour. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> who, who doesn't want to drive something called the Space Tour? Um, I, I don't know if those are commercial vans. I think those are just passenger vans. The um, Space Tour is a C4-based passenger van, I think. Yeah. it's And, I mean, honestly, I love the way they look. Um, and, really, when we're talking about FCA and mergers, we knew something was coming eventually. I mean, FCA, for the last several years, I think, has pretty much talked to everybody I didn't get a yeah. call yet asking for a merger with me personally, <laughs> but it was it was coming. So I mean, we knew it was coming, and you know this this makes this makes a really really large automaker for the entire world. I think we're going to see a lot more um, benefit to FCA in terms of some of the smaller crossovers because really they don't you don't see a lot of small crossovers with a with FCA right now. Um, no, you do have the the Jeep Renegade. Um, and the compass, but I mean, but certainly once you, get, once you get away from Jeep, though, that, yeah, right. that's no, yeah, you're Jeep, right. I mean, that's it. Is is just really those two offerings from Jeep? Whereas, well, the Fiat 500X, <sighs> which is the Jeep Renegade, basically. Yeah, I, I but, take your point. I mean, it's 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 really starting to kind of split some hairs when you see automakers like offering two or three or four different small crossovers for each of their individual brands i mean there there is no small ram crossover there well there's there's no ram crossover period there's just trucks well there's no there's there's dot the dodge um what's the the journey which is which is old which is older well, than the, I am. which is entirely forgettable <laughs> which is what i and well did, there's you know. the there's the Durango, but but below that you have the Journey, which is not even worth talking about. And then below that you have nothing. And, and nothing, nothing is really small. And and that's I mean you can see that with with Peugeot and Citroen especially. I, I think there's a really good opportunity for FCA to just you know what do a little bit of badge engineering. It's not like they haven't done it in the past, and it could it could totally work out for a, a really quick solution to kind of especially if fuel prices eventually go up. You know. I, I don't even think it has to be as quick and dirty as a as a badge re engineering because you know they they 
took the time they needed when they merged with Fiat to start building vehicles using shared manufacturing and shared development. And you got vehicles like the, the Fiat 500X and the, the uh, Jeep Renegade, which are differentiated completely. I mean, I, I, a layman wouldn't be able to tell that those were related at all by looking at them. Um, um, so I think they can. I think they can still take advantage of everything and not necessarily have to go the badge reengineering route. I hope they don't. I think you know. I always like it when automakers put more effort into distinguishing uh, the products on their platform. So let me give you my reaction because my my reaction was was pretty like pretty much like meh. And I'll tell you why. This is like, to me, this is like having an uncle who just gave you an invitation to his uh, fourth wedding. It's like in the past 20 years, uh, Chrysler has merged with Daimler, uh, Cerberus, uh, Fiat, and now PSA on top of Fiat. Uh, And it's just like going to this guy's wedding for the fourth time and being like, well, I'm not going to treat it like the first one. Uh, because we've done this so many times. And so I, you know, I think it's interesting. I think it clearly, I, I don't know the specifics of, of FCA's situation in terms of how dire it was, but it was urgent enough that um, I think Brandon, you said it, they, they were uh, shopping around the industry very publicly looking for a partner for the, for more than the past year. So um I think this is a really good deal for them. As a matter of fact, I think it's a better deal for FCA than it is for for PSA. Well, uh, I I I would say this though. The one thing that I think it's really important that we keep in mind is that PSA under Carlos Tavares, their current CEO, who will become the new I want to say he'll become the new CEO of the joint company, has been looking at coming back to the U.S. for several years, and I'd have to imagine that. They've been engineering these new platforms that they're rolling out, especially the new crossovers, with an eye towards easily federalizing them. So I think that I think we'll see the the results of this in terms of product sooner rather than later. Yeah, it'll be interesting because uh, you know you look at Fiat having come back uh, to the U.S. Um, kind of in line with their merger with Chrysler, and I wouldn't. I don't think we'd say that Fiat has been a rousing success. They're still here, but I mean, I think we're all wondering if that's going to last. Um, so re, uh, returning to the U.S. market is definitely not as easy as it sounds. It's an incredibly competitive market. So yeah, I'm I'm super interested to see in the next six months if we find out are the brands coming back, are the products coming just through the the American brands that are already here. Um, also, I want to. I'm I'm really interested. Obviously, PSA wants Jeep. You can sell Jeeps in Europe, no problem. Um, but are they going to do anything with Ram in Europe? And and Europe really hasn't been. Uh, I don't know if they don't like the giant American truck, uh, the idea of a giant American truck, or maybe they just haven't been introduced to it. Um, I, and I will if say, Ram arrives there, what will happen? Going like the, I spend a fair amount of time in Europe, and far and away the most common American pickup truck is the Ram. They're not uncommon. Like seeing Ram 1500s on European roads, especially in northern countries. Sweden, for whatever reason, loves the Ram 1500. I've driven through Stockholm and I've seen a dozen of, dozen of them in a day. My I'm, guess is, and this is a complete guess, um, the Ram represents Americana better than the F-150 and the Silverado. So like if you're a European and you're into that, like the Ram is totally the one I would go for. Yeah, That's I mean, I, I I completely agree. I, I don't think I don't think we'll see Ram go over to Europe. Maybe not in its current form, uh, but I could definitely see uh, this this joint company engineering um you know a smaller Ram model, you could call it a Dakota if you want. It doesn't need to be called that, but something of that size to compete with the Ford Ranger and the Volkswagen Amarok and the Nissan Navara and the entire lineup of small pickup trucks that are sold in Europe right now. Yeah, yeah, I I think that's we 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 already know that it's likely that uh, Ram will. Um, is developing a mid-sized pickup. Now it'll be interesting to see if PSA gets involved with that development and it becomes a, more of a global product than than just a North American one. 
So let's move on to the main topic of the podcast this week, which is Kia, and in particular, the teaser that, that Kia released of the 2021 Optima sedan. Now, this is a midsize sedan, and the teaser uh, that was released um, got a lot of reaction on Motor One, uh, definitely generated a lot of traffic, uh, comments, and as far as teasers go, it actually reveals uh, a lot of the car, particularly the front end. And, um, you know, from, from my perspective, my reaction is very positive. Um, it's, it's different. It looks aggressive, interesting, um, exciting even. Like there's definitely, I think whether you like it or not, I definitely get the impression that lots of people are going to have an emotional reaction to this design. Uh, Chris, uh, what did you think when you first saw the teaser well i've gone on record quite often on the podcast about not being a fan of the really large grill trend that's going on so i look at this and i love it it doesn't have the big grill it's got key is you know just sharp stinger grill the the, the shark grill up there or the, sorry the tiger grill and it's, it seems like every time they evolve it, they just they just focus it in a little bit better. I wasn't a really huge fan of that design to start with. Looking at it on this teaser, I I just I absolutely love it. It looks very sleek. I will say I I'm not really that interested in what they're doing with the with the headlights with the with the little LED strips around it. That that seems to kind of contrast. It, it almost has a sharpness that doesn't go with the rest of the style. Um, I don't know how prominent that's going to be in the production car, but it, I mean, it's the only thing that I really have questions on thus far. And it's a small question really for me. Yeah, I think in the in the teaser, the teaser definitely highlights that um, headlight signature. So I think that'll probably blend in a little more on the on the production car. Uh, how about you, Brandon? What did you think when you saw it? I think it's a, yet another uh sign of how well Hyundai or Hyundai and Kia in general are doing in terms of design. I mean, if you look at the Sonata and now this, there's oh, the Sonata. When I first saw the Sonata, the the new Sonata, I mean, such a gorgeous uh, mid-size sedan and it stood out to me so much because of how many automakers are exiting this segment and the car segment in general. And then you see Hyundai just put out a killer car like that and uh, yeah, I agree. I see that I'm seeing the same thing with the Optima. Well, and it's it's you know it's important to note those cars are twins. I mean they're they're the same platform. It, the Optima is the, to the Sonata as the Sonata is to the Optima. Uh, I think it's it's a very good sign that Kia can, can continue to take a familiar Hyundai product and put its own spin on it. And I think there are a lot of styling details here that are interesting that I'm excited to see how they how they shake out for the broader Kia brand. I haven't been in love with the company's design for the past few years. I think it's good, but it's never really called to me. Uh, I think this will be a really welcome injection of kind of freshness to that, to their design language, especially in the interior. I, the, we have, we, we didn't really talk about the interior sketch that they released, but it's it's a very clean cockpit like very segmented with that high transmission tunnel i i really dig it yeah um you know it's interesting you you, you bring up the fact that the sonata and the optima are sister cars sharing the same uh platform uh they're they're highly differentiated in terms of what you can see and touch uh but the mechanicals are, are largely similar underneath what i think is interesting is that both brands have their own styling chiefs. And then there's this guy that sits above both of them uh, as the head of, of design for all of Hyundai, Hyundai's motor group. Uh, and that's Peter Schreier. And it's amazing to me that you, you're right. E each, each brand gets to design their own, but they're each pushing the boundaries, I think, of design and making some really incredible designs. I'll bring up another example, um, the Kia Telluride and the Hyundai Palisade two uh, large three-row crossovers both look completely different both look great uh they've they, and they're both selling well they've been received well um and I, it's impressive to me that there's kind of two brands in the same company they're both given the same basic building blocks and you think you would think one would do a better job than the other there'd be like a a, a ranking between the two uh, but really, they're they're both doing so well in in terms of design. 
um, it kind of boggles my mind because I don't, I, I don't, that's not what I expect, especially like you said, kind of growing up uh, in the 90s and watching the uh, US automakers with their many brands and, and how they just stepped all over each other or didn't try at all and just pumped out the same car with different badges. Um, th- this is how you do uh, multiple cars on the same platform. Right. And, that, and that's the thing. I mean, that's what we got used to, right? When you look at it. And really, I'd say it started back in the 70s and, and into the 80s, especially with GM with their badge engineering. Um, I mean, it was literally the same vehicle, the same sheet metal, just with different badges, some different trim. And the idea was, we'll bump you up the chain. We'll start you in something that looks identical, but it isn't quite as plush, isn't quite as fancy. And then, you know, you know, we'll start generally with the Chevrolet and then we'll move you up to the Pontiac and then we'll move you up to the Oldsmobile and then we'll move you up to the Cadillac. And They're they certainly were certainly planning they on you buying a lot vehicle. of cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was, I mean, it was the, it was the, the case of, okay, we're going to, we're going to hold this person for their life. And, you know, starting in their in their 20s, they'll have this in their 30s, they'll have this in their in their 40s. And that's the formula we got used to. So when we see Hyundai and Kia, they're not exercising that formula. They're using the same vehicles underneath, but they are catering, in my opinion, to completely different tastes and even completely different audiences. And you see that right here with this uh, this Optima teaser and the Sonata. The Sonata has the big grill. I'm not as big of a fan of the Sonata, yeah, yeah. but and but I think it's, the Sonata, it's, it's more it's it's designed more with elegance, and I think this Optima right. looks like it's designed more with aggressiveness. Right, and and it's amazing to think that they're really they're the same car, but they're not at the same time. So, I, I, well, well, and, well, well done, South Korea. Well done. Yeah, and and you look at how uh, how Hyundai, the parent company, Hyundai Motor Group, has set up these two brands. These two brands, I would say, they compete. They compete directly with each other. It's it's not even uh, that they compete I, directly. There's like there's a genuine rivalry. Like you can't talk exactly. to like Hyundai PR people about Kia because they just want nothing to do with it. And right. it's it's in the most professional way, but it's I mean there it's there's healthy, a yeah. there's a healthy culture between those two companies that you know the the. Money comes comes from the same wallet, but they are competing with each other. And and you know what you described in the eighties and nineties, Chris, about the U.S. automakers were where GM wasn't trying to get their brands to compete against each other. They were trying to get the brands to each have their their own kind of identity and price range, so you'd move up through them. And I would say that was largely a complete failure in terms of a of a sales strategy. Where here you have. A, 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 Although I would still argue GM is still executing that strategy, even just with fewer brands, you know, Chevy, Buick, uh, Cadillac, and GMC, they're still trying to position them so that they don't compete with each other. Um, but I think that Hyundai, uh, their system has worked out much better for them, where they basically have two brands competing directly against each other, and both have been growing sales like crazy for over a decade. So, uh, you know, it's not, I, I think it's not as simple as just, you know, their strategy versus GM's. Obviously, there's a lot of cultural stuff, and it's probably some really good leaders there um, for the South Korean companies, too. But uh, I just, every generation, um, Kia and, and Hyundai, get better and better and it's almost like it's like clockwork um it's been really it's been really fun to watch because i think now they're getting to a place where they're starting to have fun uh and you look at like the kia stinger as an example of that um where that's not a car maybe where the the business case was there but maybe there were other factors um and i love seeing that you know because those can those can turn into huge hits you look at ford and like the raptor I, you know i'm sure before they launched the raptor they weren't quite sure how that was going to go and it turned into a, a huge uh success um so i i absolutely love seeing them do this and to go back to my earlier point i i like cars um i like crossovers too but i don't think that crossovers uh have to exist at the expense of cars uh, i think the reason ford and gm have not been selling well in terms of their passenger cars has been because they haven't been making good passenger cars. I don't think it's because the market is just moving wholesale away from cars into crossovers. If you look at Camry and Accord and and Optima and Sonata, you know, they're they're doing well or at least holding their own because they're better products. And, you know, Ford let Fusion and Focus all kind of wither on the vine and get older, and they just watched as the sales got lower, and then they used that as an excuse to cut them. And, well, it's and it's, it's I, very easy to rationalize something like that 
when you don't care. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> exactly. It's really easy to come up with well, a rationalization like, oh, man, these products aren't, uh, you know, it's it's never that your products are bad. It's that, oh, the market just doesn't want them anymore. Right, yeah, exactly. Which, which is such a just a load of of, of crap. It it's really a very is. American automaker thing, though. I mean, it's it, not our fault. It's your fault. It's it, like, it, precisely. It won't, it won't be uncovered. It won't be shown the light of day, the the falseness of that until they're the uh, well probably until gas prices go up or some other factor um craters suv Uh, and and pickup truck sales and suddenly the americans are left with no cars honestly i think what's going to happen is you know you look back at the past 50 years of car buying and in the 60s and 70s everyone bought station wagons and then everyone and then there's a station wagon backlash everyone bought minivans there's a minivan backlash everyone bought suvs gas prices went up so there was an suv backlash now they're getting into crossovers and i think eventually we're going to reach a point where buyers are coming up and saying you know i don't really want a crossover like what my mom and dad have i want a coupe or a sedan or a hatchback even so i think i think the market is cyclical enough that we're going to see some sort of body style that's fallen out of favor, and my God, I hope it's station wagons that comes back with a new generation of buyers. Maybe when you know people that are teenagers today, fifteen years from now, when they can afford a really nice car, they'll say, "Well, you know what? I want a wagon." Brandon, you're absolutely right. And to to follow up on that, what has existed? throughout all of these decades where people went from wagons to minivans to SUVs to crossovers, what's always been in the background sedans. And now Ford and GM are ready to walk away from that segment. They're not going to have anything to fall back. No, in, what's, in those, what's interesting in, though, is, is it, it, it really hasn't been cyclical because we sense, sense if you go, if you're just going back to the wagon, uh, I would, I would, you know, and you, you, you followed it. It's through line, you know, wagon to minivan to SUV to crossover. It hasn't returned to anything that is left yet. Um, so I, I, I don't it know. Doesn't mean I, that I it won't. It, it, it doesn't. But there's no evidence that it will either. I'm, I'm just saying it's not really cyclical. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's after the SUV. I don't know if it's another body type or if it's, a, if it's a jump to electrification and that, you know, brings with it its own body type. Um, you know, it could be anything, but I think we all know it's not going to be crossovers forever. And here again, we have the Americans going all in, putting all their chips on a, on 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 a body type and pickup trucks. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to take trucks. the devil's advocate position real quick and say that we have one thing now that we did not have in the '60s and the '70s and the '80s and the '90s and even the 2000s, and that's modular platforms. You look at what Ford is doing with its pairing down to five modular platforms, they're going to be more agile in the way that they can develop vehicle types. So it might not be a, you know, say it's five or six years to develop a new product from like clean sheet design to on sale date. That might get cut down significantly now that, you know, we have automakers that have modular front drive platforms, modular rear drive platforms. It So it might be that they're they're more they they think that they are more agile and able to respond to a sudden change in the market like that. Do I think it's a good idea to get rid of all sedans and and cars in general? Absolutely not. I think it's a terrible idea. But I think the automakers see it as, you know, what we're leaner and more agile now and we can respond to the market quicker than we ever have before. Even still though, having that agility is still not going to be enough. One I agree. Or, or especially two bad years can in this market can kill an automaker kill a, even even a giant automaker and we saw that what 10 years ago but yeah but i the, was at a ford dealership uh um about a month ago and i asked the salesman what do you think about ford getting rid of all of its cars and he said i absolutely hate it uh and one reason was because he said now for any size vehicle i sell somebody it's going to be more expensive because it's a crossover and that makes the vehicle harder for me to sell um and he also admitted uh, with a little bit of shame that he said, the problem is I can sell somebody a more expensive vehicle, but it puts them in a worse financial position. And Americans just aren't financially intelligent enough to recognize that that's a bad thing. Oh, God, we could have, we could have 
Wait, you- we could have ten. We could have ten podcasts about like the problems with new vehicle purchasing, like especially right. and, in terms of like, my, my buying point and was, financing. He felt bad because it's his job to sell cars. It's not his job to like talk people out of them. So of course he's going to sell the crossover that costs five thousand dollars more when they could have bought the sedan or or the wagon or the tall hat hatchback whatever that costs less. And and so he was kind of bemoaning that. And I think just a lack of choice. I think when he saw it as you know the more choice is better for him because he can find the right car for people. So so you mean my neighbors that uh, that are buying the seventy thousand dollar pickup trucks. Um, you know, while they're also clearly not able to afford much else, you mean they're being upsold into those pickup trucks? That can't be. Yeah, no, uh, that can't be right. <laughs> I will say, yeah. uh, I mean, they, there were just stories. On both sides. There were just stories coming out that the this was earlier this week that the sixty day delinquency rate for auto loans is past where it was when in the housing collapse. Yeah, I've been seeing I've been seeing stories like that that the next financial and crisis it's, it's is going to be gonna be, be as, it's not going to be as subprime bad. car loans. It's not going to be as bad because, you know, it it's cars versus real estate. Real estate's always going to be Right, bigger. yeah, you're but, not going to lose your house. But it's still it's still going to be very bad. If yeah. fuel prices for some reason jump, it will be just as bad oh. if, if not yes. worse. Oh yeah. If not yeah, worse. I think that's right down the thing is same road again. The thing is fuel prices will go up. They always go up. It's always going to happen and yeah, I like I said, I think it's short sighted. I think the automakers see it maybe with a little bit of hubris that, you know, we can respond to this. And and again, in their defense, the market is not going to change overnight necessarily. People are there's going to be signs that people are starting to abandon crossovers. And we're gonna start we'll start to see slowly but surely, we'll start to see sedan concepts come out and coupe concepts and automakers trying to stumble on the next big thing. That, that, that's what I think what I'm going to be looking for is signs for what is the next big thing. Cause I don't know that it'll be a return to something or something new or, or, or what I, I'm really interested to see when, when the cracks start showing and crossover popularity, what is going to be the thing that causes those cracks station wagons, people um, bring them on, bring yeah, on all the nice. station wagons. Well, let's, I wanted to finish our talk of the, of Kia and Hyundai um, with a little round table of some of our uh, favorite, um, Korean designs, but but before we get to favorites, there was a vehicle I can pinpoint when I first started noticing that Korean designs were getting good, um, and I wanted to um, have you guys tell me yours as well. I'll start with mine to set the stage. So it was actually before Peter Schreier arrived uh, at um, Kia. Um, I'm t- what, what popped into my head was the 2002 Hyundai Tiburon. Now there were a lot of there were like two or three generations of Tiburon before 2002, and they were terrible. Um, really, they look like fish on wheels. You're, I would you're say. thinking of the Ferrari 550 lookalike, aren't you? Yes, I am exactly. Uh, and that it was it was it was what I perceived as. Um, Hyundai going from kind of immature, silly designs to a mature design, like they were trying to be serious. And I really, really liked it at the time. I was a lot younger, uh, but I, you know, uh, for for a coupe, it just looked really, really sharp, um, almost sophisticated, which at the time you would just never, ever apply an adjective like that to a Hyundai design at the time. Um, so I give them really big props for that. And then the other one I point to, and I think this is probably the more common one, is the 2009 Hyundai Sonata. There was, um, it went, uh, the Sonata went from just a, probably the blandest sedan design you could think of to something that was so expressive. Um, lots of curves, um, not a straight line on it. Um, and that's when it started. That's when the Sonata got that um, chrome line that goes from like the headlight all the way up to the A-pillar. Um, and yeah, that's when that's when I think the was one of the f- kind of first designs that ushered in this era of really great uh, South Korean automotive design. Uh, Brandon, what about you? What was the first Korean design that really struck your eyeballs? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to say because I I'm weird in that I liked some of the older terrible ones. Like I want to say it was the I don't even remember what year it is, but it was a like an Elantra in the '90s, and it was just it was a neat piece of design. I I don't know what it was that I really liked about it, but in terms of more modern stuff, it has to be the Optima. I mean, the, from the from the time it rolled out, I always thought I thought the Optima was maybe not the most interesting, but the best looking Korean car on the market. You get an Optima, Optima SX in white with like the sun, the, the sunroof or the blacked out roof or whatever. And 
it w- it looked like a stormtrooper on wheels. It was a very very cool looking car, and not just the exterior design. The interior design was really interesting too. You had these really nice quilted leather seats that. Now, are you talking about the third third generation one that lines up with the Sonata that I was just talking about? So, like two thousand ten. Uh, yes, that one, but also a little bit beyond that, the uh, the fourth generation one, which is on sale right now, which was a very modest uh, redesign. It was a very, very light redesign. But yeah. both of those cars are, it's just so good looking. And it's, it's, it's not super exciting. It's just, you, you see one drive by and just it's handsome. like, that's a good looking yeah. car. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, Chris, what about you? I'm going to I'm going to jump around here a little bit because um the, I just have a lot to say on this that uh, that I think is relevant. You guys remember the Hyundai Scoop back from the mid 90s? Hell yeah, I remember the Hyundai I've Scoop. Never heard I mean, of that I'm, car. I'm not I I'm not I'm not going to pick that as the one that made me go wow, but I I clearly remember that just for Hey, it was, it was this kind of sporty looking two door. I remember a guy that I was working with in a job um at high school. He managed to get one and it was yellow. And it wow. just got lots of attention. But, he, I mean, he was a high school – or, no, he was just out of high school. I don't know how he afforded it. But um, I remember he stopped driving it all of a sudden. And then one day he was like, yeah, I got it parked in my barn because the repo guys are looking for it. So <laughs> that kind of left nice. an impression on me. So um, people were making bad financial decisions about their cars back then too? I, I think people have made bad financial decisions mm-hmm. about their cars for decades. But for yeah, I mean, that just stuck into my mind. It's like, yeah. it's like how rough do you got to be to be, you know – hunted by the repo guy for your Hyundai. Right, it's, right. You know, for back back in the 90s, I mean, these cars were like crazy cheap back then. They and were. and that kind of segues to what I'm going to say next. My wife almost leased a Hyundai Elantra in, in the late 90s. Brandon, you were talking about that Elantra. And yeah, it was a good looking car. And I remember, I think they also had the, the GT5 door around that same time. It was a great looking car. She didn't lease it because the Hyundai dealer in Kalamazoo, Michigan, I don't know if you guys are still around, but you you were just like the the worst salespeople ever as far as uh you know treating women with respect. So she went over to the Mitsubishi dealer and got a Mitsubishi Mirage. That's how bad the Hyundai wow. dealer treated her. She got a she got a ninety seven Mitsubishi Mirage. The, Hopefully the Mirage was better back in nineteen ninety seven. I don't remember specifically, it, but it, it couldn't have been it, worse than the Mirage today. You know, I mean, they the, the dealership offered a really good um, a really good lease deal. And uh, I mean, she was, you know, just young in college at the time. And I mean, no, it, it, it wasn't that great. It, it, it was. Oh, no, I just, was, I just looked up the it, it was, Mirage. It, no, was was good, it was slow. It was, well, it was slow. Um, I was driving tour shows at the time. So she was, she was used to that as she get in the Mirage. It's just like, oh, this doesn't go anywhere. But yeah, I mean, no it, tourist show. I, I mean, it, um, it. I mean, I mean, it sort of had the. Uh, I think back then the Mirage was still really closely tied to the uh, to the Lancer at that point. It was, yeah. Which which we couldn't get in the state, so uh, you know, I always thought, hey, it's, check me out, I'm driving an Evo, and no, I'm really not. <laughs> but <laughs> well, let me let me let's keep rolling with you then, um, and get your favorite Korean design of all time. The not one, just the first one, but the first the, one you remember, but the, the favorite. I, I see. This is where it's tough. The, what really turned my head to say hey south korea is is getting pretty legit i rather like the fifth gen sonata the one that you just called the the most boring i actually rather whoa. like that it was that's wait, that's, whoa, a, wait, that's wait, a bad wait. take but, but there's there, there's 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 wait more here. to it than that though there's more to it it's i mean it's it's a fairly sedate design it kind of reminds me of a camry of the period but you know i i rather just kind of liked the the simpleness of it all there was an article that Car and Driver did in 2007 about speed cameras in Arizona. And the focus of that was this Hyundai Sonata that got caught by a speed camera going 147 miles an hour. Was it even capable of it? That was Well, that was the question. And that was like, yeah. holy crap, this Sonata's doing 147 miles an hour? This, this Hyundai? Really? It goes that fast? So that turned my head. And that made me look closer at hyundai and honestly i've loved that fifth gen sonata ever since i know so I, I I've, actually, I've got a, i've got a, i've got to credit that for saying hey that's what woke me up i don't begrudge you that because i think that generation the one before i picked it was super clean it was super like 
you're right. Simple. Um, I don't. Elegance a strong word, but it, it was it was it was clean. It it wasn't dynamic, but it was clean. When you go right. back to the to the fourth gen, that just it 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 had those kind of awkward. Oh, the fourth gen oval, was like ovalish headlights. Yeah. The yeah, fifth yeah, gen yeah. was was pretty clean, and if, yeah. if not if not you know exciting, not exciting in any measure, but. Man, the fact that people were asking, can this car even go 147 miles an hour? I think that was some of the best unintended PR that Hyundai may have ever got. Can, it, can <laughs> I can I rephrase my answer? Because I, I've, I've had a think, and, and I know Uh-oh. what my new answer is. And it wasn't even okay. a car that you could buy. But it was a car that made me realize the, the Koreans are starting to get it. And it was the Santa Cruz concept. The small, oh, uh... the small pickup truck. And it was oh, yeah, yeah. such a cool piece of design, so interesting, and I'm still upset that they haven't built the damn thing. Well, it's supposedly still on its way to production, but at this point, I don't know um, how I mean, I'm going to be able to collect Social Security by the concept. time it comes out. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, that's a great choice in terms of the concepts. Um, definitely one of, one of my favorite, too. Um, Chris, did you... Was that your... Fa- is that your favorite? I've, I've, I've got a... I've got a it's not my favorite, but I have to acknowledge it in this case has my favorite because that's the car that really oh, woke okay. me up to to South Korea and to Hyundai and, and to Kia and to realize, hey, the, the, you know, these aren't kind of joke cars anymore. I had I had the occasion to drive a Kia Sophia way back in the 90s oh. when I was uh, going to college. I worked for a used car dealer. That car was scary. I was in a light rain shower. It sounded like I was in a hailstorm. <laughs> I, I mean, it was just those such were a, they were practically disposable. It, it was such a just a an odd experience to to be in a car like that. And this, I mean, this this wasn't an old car. And then um, I, I actually I managed to drive a Kia Rio a few years later, and that car was pretty terrible. But even even by the, that standard, it was a lot better. And then when yeah. I got into a Soul sometime later. Um, wow. Okay. This is actually pretty good. All right. So before we, we get off, um, uh, Korean, I do want to give a shout out to my favorite Korean, uh, design, uh, which you just mentioned, Chris, which is the soul. Um, and, um, I will admit, uh, I owned one for a little while. Uh, we had a 2014 Kia soul for a few years, uh, that we really enjoyed, but even bef- that was a second gen, uh, even before that, the first gen I thought was, um, an exceptional design that was really fun. And it was one of those designs, uh, you know, I talked about eliciting an emotion before. um, And I think it elicited lots of positive emotion from people. It wasn't like a Mustang where you, you know, like that was nostalgic or aggressive. It was fun. And I think people really gravitated towards that. And the soul was introduced among kind of a sea of other kind of boxy hatchback competitors, all of which are gone now. And the soul remains and not even not just that, but the soul is one of, if not the best selling Kia vehicle every month. Like that's how successful that design was. And it's now in its third generation. Um, so, uh, practically created a, a, a segment for Kia that, uh, it definitely didn't exist at the time. And it took Hyundai a long time to, to field something in that, uh, that same segment. Um, so good on them for that. Um, all right, I want to move on um, to talk about last week's podcast because we had some feedback, some listener comments uh, that I wanted to read um, and then get your reaction to. Um, you guys weren't on the last episode with me when we talked about the Volkswagen Golf 8, and that's what all the reaction was to. Um, so I'll come to you guys uh, after we go through the comments. So the first comment is from a reader named Steve, and he says, if Volkswagen doesn't send the base Golf 8 here, it won't satisfy my needs. I would definitely miss it. And if it doesn't come here, I'll have to buy a GTI. Uh, and then uh, another commenter, Dimitri, responded, which is uh, kind of exactly what I, how I would respond, which is, he says, I think that's exactly what they'd be banking on. If they don't offer the base golf, then many VW lovers will have to pay for the next tier up, even if they don't necessarily want a performance-oriented car. More money for them while not having to pay to offer more cars here. Um, I, I largely think that that's kind of true because the GTI and the Golf R together were outselling the base Golf 8 here in the U.S. So clearly people who wanted Golfs were bypassing the, the, the regular Golf anyway. Um, so I think if they don't sell it here, um, U.S. consumers aren't really going to miss it. Um, but let me, let me read another comment from a gentleman named Oliver. 
He says, I drive a uh, Mark VI Golf um, for the very reason that many here dislike it. It's an understated, overlooked, and generally invisible car that even in base form outmaneuvers and outdrives many performance cars. It fits in small parking spots. It holds nearly as much stuff as the average small SUV, and it gets much better fuel economy than most of them. It's also much higher quality than most in places that matter like interior. Um, so he makes a good point. I think that's a good reason a lot of people like golfs is because they're kind of just understated and, um, a little classier than some of the, the small cars, uh, that are available in the U S but the golf eight, um, everybody seems to have, have generated a, a reaction to it. So let me get yours, Brandon, what do you think about the golf eight, uh, that debuted a couple of weeks ago and particularly about, uh, the possibility it might not be sold here in the U S. I mean, I'm fine with it. Uh, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, cars and stands and hatchbacks and, and how they're kind of uh, fading out of the U.S. market. In the case of the, the Golf, I've always found it to be a very good car, but kind of kind of an obsolete car because Americans have never been big on hatchbacks. And the ones that are have no problem going to the GTI. And the Jetta has always existed to fill that small car need. So I'm, I'm, am I disappointed by it as somebody that likes European cars and especially likes European hatchbacks? Yeah, I, I absolutely am bummed that it might not be sold here, but we'll still get the GTI. We'll still get the golf R and that's really, you know, it, that's one of those rare cases where in terms of the heart of a car, it's in the performance models like that. It's it. That's, that's where the volume goes. That's where the money goes. Um, the, the overall design I like, I think it's very attractive. I think the interior is gorgeous. It's smart. It's tech forward. It has, you know, the same right size blend of, you know, space and such a small footprint. So I'm, I'm, I'm eager to drive it at some point. You know, I pretty much agree with Brandon and, you know, I, I got to agree with Oliver as well. Oliver, you're spot on on your comment. It fits in small parking spots. It holds nearly as much stuff as the average small SUV. It gets better fuel economy. If the Golf was lifted a little bit, it would probably sell a lot better. Because Don't hatchback, give them any ideas. We, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, could, we could have a Safari Golf, couldn't we? Come on. We, uh, we could the, do this. What was the, I, I mentioned it. Call, call the it the Golf episode. Safari. Yeah, there was uh, the lift. What was the lifted golf in the '90s? I mentioned it in the last episode, uh, the synchro golf or something. Oh, I, I I can't remember. But the, you know the the point there is, you know, hatchbacks have always been a four letter word in the United States. They've always been regarded as just the cheap, basic entry car, which is why they never really took off and why companies are still struggling. And you know, for Volkswagen to not send the base golf here, I mean, the sales support that the the GTI and the R, I, I think they outsell two to one, if not more, yeah. versus the regular Golf. So yeah, the the person that would buy the regular Golf, they'll step up to the GTI. You know, and it really, really it's not a huge. It's not going to be. A, I don't think it's going to be a huge price difference. No, because actually the Golf kind of had a premium of a price in yeah. the hatchback segment. Anyway, you know, I think this is it, you know it, rare, if not has never happened before, where a company has pulled the regular version of a car and kept the performance models in a country rather than the other way around. Well, um, it shows just how devoted Volkswagen. Yeah. The, the GTI Volkswagen and, and our are, fans. Yeah. And, and just how well regarded those cars are as well. Yeah. All right. Well, we'd love to hear what you think about, um, well, not only last episode, but this episode, the Koreans, the FCA merger, uh, all of that. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, where this discussion and many more will continue. And of course, go to our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find us in the comments. Now, coming up, you'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Before the break, though, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get podcasts. So please hit the subscribe button so you never miss a show. Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Brandon. What have you been driving? Well, I have been spending a great deal of time with the new Lincoln Aviator Grand Touring Black Label. It is the most expensive aviator money can buy. The example that I had was about loaded for, I want to say, eighty-eight dollars or $89,000. So 
not cheap Oof. by any stretch, but and this is the Lincoln Lincoln version of the Ford Explorer, right? So to give yeah, people a relative it, the, size. Yeah, that would. Yeah, in terms of size, it's it's. I'll go into why that's not really a great argument anymore in a minute, but um, I put a lot of miles on this thing. I, I normally drive press cars about 150 to 250 miles a week. I put 900 miles on this car in a week. Um, drove it to Wisconsin and back, drove it all over southeastern Michigan. I I spent a lot of time with this car, and honestly, it's 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 an incredible vehicle if you think about where Lincoln as a brand was even just five years ago. It is supremely quiet on the freeway, and the ride is fantastic. the The interior is gorgeous. The audio system is to die for. It's a twenty eight speaker Revel audio system. There are thirty way seats. I mean, there there really wasn't a thing that this vehicle offered that I I uh, there wasn't a thing I was left wanting for with this vehicle. And it's it's powerful too. I mean, five hundred horsepower, yeah, six hundred thirty yeah, pound feet of torque. It from a, a plug-in hybrid powertrain with a V6 did it, engine. Did it feel that powerful? Because I've read reports that yeah, it doesn't feel like it's it, a it, 500 horsepower. Yeah, vehicle. it doesn't. It doesn't kick your teeth in, but it is more. There's more than enough power for what most drivers will need with it. If you need to execute a pass, it will make the pass. And around town, the electric torque may, means it feels much quicker than it really is. So if you got to shoot a gap in traffic, it can do that. The thing I was really excited about to to when I was driving it though was to see how it uh, what kind of fuel economy the plug-in hybrid powertrain would deliver, and like I said, I I drove this thing far and wide. I'd say probably eighty percent of the miles that I put on it were on the freeway, uh, but I was had the cruise control set at eighty miles an hour, and I mean I was cooking. I was I was move it along with some speed so with the like taking advantage of the plug-in to powertrain i did about 25 percent of my mileage on electric power alone it's rated really that's a lot because it's only its range is only like it's only 20 miles. it's only yeah i was seeing 21 miles but i'm fortunate mm-hmm. that i work from home and i kept it plugged in when i was you know driving around once so with that range calculated in i was getting about 27 miles to the gallon but if you take the electric electrification out of the equation and just put it on the freeway at 80 miles an hour, by the time I got done, I was averaging about 19 and a half miles per gallon, which isn't great when you think about a plug-in hybrid, but I, I think for yeah, the size of the vehicle and the, the level of power, it's it's not under. There's always, there's always two kinds of plug-in vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles out there. There's ones that have that technology for fuel efficiency and others that have it for power. And I think this... This, this, is, in, this in, is the latter case. Right. And I just, I just drove the... Um, Seven uh, BMW 745e, and it was the same thing. It had apps. It actually had not good fuel economy. It wasn't even the most fuel efficient seven series. The base seven series uh, gas without high, without any electrification is actually more fuel efficient than the um, um, than the 745e uh, after the range end. So that doesn't surprise me. I, uh, but it's it's actually a really cool wave, I think, for Lincoln to get. Uh, incredibly impressive power numbers, like 500 horsepower. And nobody saw that coming when they announced that, and I think it all kind of made us gasp. Well, and, and in terms of in terms of that electric range, like I w- I had enough range that I had I attended a backgrounder earlier this week for a product that I can't talk about yet. You'll find out about it soon. Uh, but it was about. 16 17 miles away and i made it there on a single charge and if you have the ability to charge up at your workplace this is a vehicle it's not great ev range but it's enough that you could yeah i mean dramatically cut down that, on that's, your fuel that's a good point that's a good use. point i mean i mean when you said 19 my first thought was sheesh my old 25 year old five liter old technology mustang gets 20 on the highway but when you when you talk about it that way, you're absolutely right. Running around in town, local, you know, s- shorter distances, it's all electric. Yeah, yeah. I, if- I I kind of agree, but I, I think again, it's still it was made for power. Like eighteen miles it's, it's is absolutely o- made for is power. okay. 
But the amount of people who are also going to have a charging station at their workplace is very, very small. But, but even if you don't, um, you have enough electric range to cut it, cut your gas use in half, basically. Yeah. Perhaps in half, right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's... And when you factor that in, it becomes a little bit easier of a pill to swallow. But here's why... Here's why I wouldn't get the Grand Touring. And it's an issue that we had in the Explorer. It's an issue that I had when I drove the the Aviator uh, Grand Touring at the launch event back in August, is the integration between the gas electric powertrains is just not quite... They're not quite on the same page. It's it's kind of like they're two, speaking two very similar but different languages. So like Portuguese and Spanish. Mm-hmm. Where you get you, you go to step on the pedal and it, and especially if you suddenly apply throttle, it's not sure what power source it should be using. So you get this weird stumbling before the power kicks in, and it just doesn't respond that well to sudden changes. So if you come to a stop and then go to take off from a light and give it too much gas or too much accelerator, it kind of stumbles like, oh, you want an electric? Oh no! Now you want gas. What do I do now? And well, so uh, that for that reason, surprise me actually. Yeah, because I mean, think think about Ford's um, experience with plug-in hybrids before this. It was all with their energy uh, energy well, with an I, I, vehicles, I, which were four-cylinder cars with very little power. Now you're talking about jumping from that to many hundreds of horsepower more well there there are um, also there are also mechanical reasons in the approaches that they take versus a four-cylinder plug-in like that so if you talk about the say the high and I, I talked about this in my first drive of the ford escape hybrid there are different technologies and different layouts of the hybrid architecture from the four-cylinder escape to the which uses a single speed i want to say it's a or ECVT, an electronic CVT, to a vehicle that uses a 10-speed automatic transmission, has right. to tow. And so there are definitely they definitely made compromises to to allow the ve- the vehicles to tow and well, do all this stuff. And some of that was was refinement. And I think they'll get I think they'll sort that out as time goes on, but and for now I think the to, the main issue is that it's just very different technology than what they've done before. The, and that's actually a good point about the transmissions because I remember having done some research on the on the electronic CVT that Ford used because it was basically the same the exact same transmission yeah, it was that Toyota used in the Prius. Too. Yeah, yeah, and it's very clever, very uh, high tech in how it blended the power from a from an electric motor and an engine. Uh, and I don't really know the mechanics of how uh, stepped ten speed automatic uh, deals with. Uh, power from two sources so um yeah that's interesting I, i'm interested to see if they work that out um uh, or or if it's kind of a function of just the the different mechanics of that type of transmission I, versus i will CVT. say ba- based on based on my conversations with ford is i i think they're very aware of the refinement issues mm-hmm. um and i i think it's something that they're going to actively work on but I think it, they they're seeing it as well. This is just you know the price that we have to pay for the time being to get these to get these hybrid powertrains in these vehicles. Yeah, and look, they 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 put a great number up on the scoreboard with the power, you know, five hundred horsepower. So I think they're hoping that that gets people in the door and and to try it out. Uh, all right, well let's. Uh, Chris, I'm going to hop over you because you told us before the show that you haven't really driven anything new in the past week. Um, so don't think I'm ignoring you. <laughs> I, I mean, I haven't really driven anything new. Um, I did do a little bit of off-roading in my Mazda 6, my 2004 Mazda 6. Um, of course, that sounds I, appropriate. I, I'm, I'm 40 miles from Badlands National Park um, in western South Dakota, which, I mean, if you've never seen it, it's an amazing place to be. But if you go just a little bit south of there, you get into the White River Badlands, which is still Badlands. It's just there aren't paved roads to really access it. So mm. there's there's a really kind of a snaky little dirt road that turns into a two track that if you go even further, they say the high clearance is recommended, which is why I didn't go further. The only thing preventing me was the, the Mazda 6. It's a little low, but uh, um, you know, just just a reminder that you can explore a lot of places and you don't need a crossover to do it. You don't need a pickup truck to do it. You don't even need a tremendous amount of ground clearance to do it. I was in some areas where, you know, I had to keep my wits about me, but the little front wheel drive Mazda took me to one of the most extraordinary places I've ever seen. 
So. That's awesome. Can you um, can you camp out there? Can you stay there overnight? Yes, um, Badlands National Park. You can pretty much camp anywhere. I think you need to have permits to do it. There are all kinds of hiking trails. Um, going a little bit further south, you get onto the Pine Ridge um, Indian Reservation. So that's you know things are a little different down there, right? Um, but I yeah, ask because uh, all kinds of camping out here. Like I mentioned, my wife and I are really into camper vans, and we're always you know looking at YouTube videos. Um, huh. And you know some of them you they would put lift kits on. Um, there's obviously four wheel drive sprinters you can get and things like that, um, just for that purpose. So you can go a little bit off road, get a little bit away from people, mm-hmm. um, and find your own spot. Um, so that's actually that's good to hear. Yeah. Come on uh, out. Our, absolutely. I'm totally coming out. Um, all right. So last week, um, or actually this week, what I have right now, what I'm driving is a 2019 Audi A7. Um, and I was really excited to get the keys to this because uh, obviously, uh, you know, we drive a lot of new vehicles every year. Um, and I still remember when I first drove an Audi A7 uh, of the first generation one. Um, and it was easily one of my favorite cars of that year. And I, I still remember it because of how much I liked it. Um, it was one of the few cars that as like an automotive journalist, I've driven and, and said, like, I could drive that every day. I could, I could give up driving media vehicles and reviewing cars and just drive this car. I, I so I, I was a really big fan of the first gen. Um, so this current generation, um, for me, has not lived up to the to the impression that the first generation uh, gave me. Uh, I think one one part of it is the the exterior styling. Um, I think that that first generation, uh, including both the original and they they kind of did a refresh a little that tweaked the headlights. Um, that design was just one of my favorites of all time. It was so good looking, not a sharp edge on it. It was all curves. Um, and looks so long and and perfect with that hatchback and sloping r- rear, uh, roof in the rear. I just loved it. Um, and this current design is a lot of creases, a lot of sharp edges. And to me, and I've, I've kind of complained about this uh, before concerning Audi designs, is Audi just kind of takes the design and just kind of keeps evolving it every generation but never really takes a risk or reinvents it or uh, they just keep tweaking it and keep tweaking it. And I think eventually they get farther away from what made it beautiful in the first place. And I think that's for me what ha- has happened to the A7. I don't think it, I don't think it has the same proportions as the original that I love so much. I don't think it, uh, the design is as um, elegant or, or iconic. I think it has just kind of, suffered that same fate of of many Audis, which is just going going through the Audi ringer, uh design ringer um too many times. I um, I I'm going to disagree with that. Okay. I'm I th- I think it's uh I think they've evolved it well. I def I do agree that sometimes Audi could stand to be a little bit more revolutionary than evolutionary. But in in terms of the proportions, I mean they're they're very similar from from the first gen to the second gen. And in terms of uh, the, I think they've modernized the design a bit and I get that that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I really, really like this car. I think it's better looking than the first gen one by a, a pretty fair yeah, margin. But see, I don't, I, I don't think adding creases and sharp angles equals modernization. Like to me, they're just, I mean, did they, me, did they add that many though? I mean, yeah, yeah. Go park them side by side. Yeah, I've been I've been looking at pictures the last few days, and it is, it, it it's I'm not gonna say it's vastly different. Um, I'm just gonna repeat what I said in that it's just, just the same thing Audi does. It just starts it just starts playing with it, and and making to me it's more about they they're just making changes for making changes sake. They're not making it look better or more modern. They it, it's like they hit a bullseye on the first throw, and they decide you know rather than being happy with that, they're just gonna keep throwing. I mean, um, we'll agree to dis- disagree on that one. Yeah, I'll, now, I'll fall in the middle on that because John, you have a good point, but I, I still think it's a good-looking car. I, I, I think I don't want to call it ugly. Right. I, I, yeah, I don't want to. I'm not saying it's an ugly car. I think if they had come out with this first and the first generation had never come out, I'd probably say it's a great-looking car. And that's but, saying a lot for me because I hate these big grills. So <laughs> yeah, it is a big grill car for sure. 
Um, now inside it's totally different. I mean, the, the first Lovely gen interior. interior was great for the day, but modern Audi interiors, um, are amazing. They're excellent. Um, so inside is absolutely a wonderful place to be. Um, now this one is $83,000. Um, so it's, it's about as much as the Lincoln, uh, aviator grand touring, uh, you were driving, uh, but it's just the regular a seven just has the regular three liter, uh, V six. Um, so yeah, you're, it's, I, I will say high price to pay. I, I drove, I drove an a six earlier this year and I, I was blown away with the way it drove. I thought it drove was probably one of the best driving cars in the Audi lineup. It's, it was just had just the right amount of power. The transmission tuning was great. The, the chassis tuning was excellent. It was really nicely balanced between agility and ride comfort. And it was a car that I just wanted to spend more time in. Do you, do you feel that way about, about the a seven? I, because I mean, they, they are, they are mechanical twins, right? They are mechanical twins. I don't necessarily disagree with everything you just said. Like, like I think all of that's pretty much true. However, I also feel like that's sort of been true of most Audis and, and honestly, Mercedes Benz and BMW. It's like that, that's their thing to get the balance between ride and handling perfect so that there's no sacrifice on either end. And I think depending on the decade, the generation of car, they may, you know, succeed or fail at that to some degree, but more so than almost any other automakers, they manage to, to get that balance right. Um, so I, I can I can say, yeah, it drives really, really well. Um, the engine and, and transmission are perfect dance partners. All of that is true. But I guess for me, that's like a, that's like uh, a minimum bar for Audis, BMWs and Mercedes is is they should get that. I don't get the feeling like I want to get in it and and go drive for fun. Um, I, I, I more get the feeling that I'm I'm happy to get in it to drive when I do. But it doesn't like beg me to go out you know, driving, uh, with no purpose just for fun. Um, so, but I, that, that might be personal taste too. Um, cause I might've said the opposite about the first gen a seven, because it, for me, I remember it being the smoothest driving car I, I had driven at the time, just like it could, it was just, it, it was almost so quiet. It, it was like an EV it's, uh, throttle, um, kind of sensitivity and reaction to throttle was just so linear and smooth. It was just that that's what I remember from that, that first a seven. And I drove many a sevens after that, of that generation too. And of course their personalities change as you go up the ladder to S and RS and all that. But, um, uh, but yeah, I, honestly, I love the a seven. I think it was a great idea. It spawned, uh, it wasn't the first car of that type. I think we'd give that to the Mercedes CLS class, uh, but I think it instantly became one of the best ones in the segment and, and remains to that day. Um, clearly, I think you're hearing, though, that I had a really high bar for the current A7 that is struggling to, to, to beat the bar that my memory sets of the first one. All right, so that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at chwriting. Uh, Brandon Turkis at Brandon Turkis and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you two for being here co-hosting with me. Gentlemen, always a pleasure. All right. And thank all of you out there for listening. We'll see you next week.